lift off. Hello, thank you for joining us for tonight's event. I'm Emily and when I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. In the coming weeks, we're looking forward to welcoming Eva Holland on July 1st, Paige McKenzie and Nancy Olin on July 7th, and Mario Livio on July 8th, among others. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. As well, if you haven't already done so, you may sign up for our weekly events email at powells.com. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Gregory Benford and Larry Niven. Gregory Benford is a respected astrophysicist and plasma physicist at the University of California, a recipient of the United Nations Medal for Literature, and the author of more than 20 novels, including the Nebula award-winning Timescape. Larry Niven is the award-winning author of the Ringworld series, along with many other science fiction masterpieces, and a recipient of the Nebula Award, five Hugos, four Locus Awards, the Prometheus, and the Robert A. Heinlein Award, among other honors. Their new novel, Glorious, concludes the Bowl of Heaven series, praised by Booklist as a solid adventure and entertaining speculation on the lives of alien creatures. This evening's event will also include a Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please consider upvoting that particular question. Perhaps most importantly, please consider supporting Gregory Benford, Larry Niven, and Powell's by purchasing a copy of Glorious. A link to buy the book was included in your registration email and will also be shared in the chat a few times this evening. Without any further ado, please welcome Gregory Benford and Larry Niven. How do you do? Hi, great to be here. Oh, by the way, there are book plates we sent you for at least some of the books. And, uh, so we're on, right? And we're on. Emily's we're on. Uh, assuming everyone can hear us. Uh, you are on, and everyone can hear you. <laughs> good, uh, good. Let, let's, let's just jump straight to the to, to the real art. A, a slideshow we've arranged for you that shows off the book, uh, and we talk about what it's about. It, it, the, the subject we'll dwell on is big smart objects because there's a an old term in the field called big dumb objects which I always disliked because in fact, no large object can be totally dumb, meaning needs no maintenance, or it simply falls apart or runs aground or falls into the sun, whichever <laughs> case you want, such as Larry's ring world. Next slide. The um, ring world, which made Larry famous, is uh, basically a, a strip the size of, of these Earth's orbit illuminated by a star, and people live on the inside, held to it by centrifugal force, not gravitation. So Larry wrote this notable novel, and from 1970 on, he's been identified with the, uh, the big object subculture, you might say, which goes all the way back to Freeman Dyson. Next slide. Uh, but, uh, Let's see, you're seeing the Dyson sphere diagram, right? This Dyson, Freeman Dyson, who unfortunately died this year at the age of uh, 95, uh, envisioned a swarm of objects around a star that would absorb all the, the sunlight and therefore get the maximum out of a, star, star, uh, of, a, of a star instead of shedding it off into the night sky. And uh, he didn't really mean it for it to be a sphere, but rather a swarm of objects. But you can make it into at least some kind of large construct. And that's what Larry did with Ringworld. Next. Um, the advantage, of course, of these big objects is that they can harness a lot of sunlight. It's not just like solar panels on your house, a little piece of the landscape. It's everything. It runs everything. And there are various uh, varieties of it. You can put it in, uh, in this coordinate system, north-south orbits, or in the next slide, you can do it in east-west orbits. They each require some control. And that's the point. Even if you get in the, in the next slide toward building a Dyson sphere, you're slowly going to capture all the sunlight. And that idea uh, has uh, worked in our own minds for quite a long while. And that of Arthur C. Clarke, for example, his rendezvous with Rama a few years after Ringworld 
is a, is a rotating cylinder, which has uh, an alien purpose that we don't know. It's certainly a, an interesting novel worth reading. This cylinder just comes through the solar system, doesn't slow down, just uses apparently the sun as a delta V, a change in velocity, and moves on. But humans go and explore it, and there's some things they understand and some things they don't, and that's kind of the model for our novel, too. Next. Um, let's see, are, are we, we're now looking at the bowl of heaven, are we? Yes. The yes. Whole, yeah, I think we showed a slide earlier. I'm seeing two different so, things. Or rather, the, uh, you've gotten behind yourself. The, the or ahead of myself. Pictures of the bowl of heaven. Right. So uh, the, the thing is, I'm seeing two different slides on my screen. I don't know which is first. I, I guess if you go back one slide and we talk about how in the beginning of the novel, the first novel of this three novel set, bowl of, the Bowl of Heaven series, is uh, a starship with humans aboard headed for a distant star, comes upon this strange object the size of a solar system coasting through space, and they wonder what it is. Meanwhile, they're having problem with their, their fuel and so forth. They need some maintenance and repair. So they decide to get into it somehow and try to resupply and also discover it. Because after all, the inner surface of a bowl of heaven is enormously larger than the surface of all the planets in the solar system. And therefore, it's a giant habitat, far larger than anything it had ever envisioned if anyone had ever envisioned, except it was people like us. <laughs> Next. So when you haul alongside this thing, you see that it's being driven by the tendency of the bowl to fall toward the star. Although the bowl is rotating, it's not orbiting the star. Uh, meanwhile, the star itself ejects a jet that drives the whole system forward. So it's inherently unstable. I mean, look at us, human beings. We're the only large animal that walks around on two legs and does not have a tail. Uh, so like a kangaroo say. So we actually walk by falling forward and catching ourselves. We're dynamically unstable. So is the bowl. And the point is who built this and why? Of course, for the obvious reason that it's a giant habitat. That outer blue and white rim is the, and a titanic ocean also, by the way, called the Titanic Ocean, because it's certainly not Pacific. Uh, and this is a place to live and cruise around the solar system, or rather, not the solar systems, or the galactic system. So they are actually going around the galaxy, visiting other star systems while remaining at home. So it's the ultimate travel. Uh, I've lost the slide on my view, but it doesn't matter much. Uh, the next slide shows you how it works. The bowl is spinning, so centrifugal gravity, just as in ring world, takes care of holding people, actually not people, but rather aliens, and soon enough people, to the surface. Um, it's a centrifugal machine. And as they come in, the, there's one slide showing the starship itself flying into the jet of the system. Why? Because they, they think about going in or right around the rim, the outer rim, but they notice that it's heavily defended and there's some suspiciously large lasers, uh, which turn out to emit gamma rays. Uh, are, they're too defended against interlopers. So they, instead they run up the, the one way that's not defended because Apparently, the aliens thought nobody would be crazy to go upstream to the jet, but the humans do, and they get through. And as they come in, they see these interesting views. There's a close-up of the ocean with all those giant storms in it. Those are hurricanes in the making, by the way. Uh, and then giant hexagons of vegetation and solar panels and all kinds of stuff. A, a whole civilization with, you'll notice, a very large beachfront property uh, the size of the Earth's orbit. Uh, next to the ocean. Uh, next. Next comes a close up further of what things look like inside the bowl. Are you seeing the next slide? I'm not. No. 
Emily? I can't be sure that I'm seeing the next slide. But if I, if you are, instead of us, uh, the point is that from the inside of the bowl, there's this spectacular views available to everyone there. So it's always sunny. It's always mild. It's kind of like Florida um, without the well, they, I was about to say without hurricanes. I've been through a lot of hurricanes because I grew up on the Gulf Coast. Well, actually, they do have hurricanes on the bowl, but that they apparently don't build um, small structures to, to try to deal with it the way most people do in Florida. So the, um, the essential story is that this is a habitat that has different things in it. For example, if you go to the next slide, there should be um, a picture of how the whole landscape looks and further along enough in the slide you can see a view in which you see a zigzag tree and some human beings over to the left walking away and then uh, in another slide I can't, I can't tell whether the viewers are seeing these slides at all can you <laughs> It looks like Kim lost it for just a second. She'll be back in just a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the point is that there, there are all kinds of habitats there. The gravity varies with how far you are away from the axis of the bowl, <clears throat> but also how close you are to the jet. The jet goes through what we call the knot hole <clears throat> to get out of the system, of course. The jet is the propulsion that drives the entire system forward. These kinds of ideas, by the way, go back for several decades, but they weren't nearly well thought through in my estimation. There was a Russian physicist who thought about it generally, but never did any calculations. Um, I and Larry did the calculations. And it's, uh, of course, gargantuan in all its, all its many ways. Uh, th the idea here was to try to think about what are the limits of the civilization? We already know what the limits of our planet are. We've covered it all up with cities and people, too many, in fact. So what if you had an enormously larger landscape? Well, you could house much more population. You could have much more of a large creative culture. The, the reason to have a larger uh, housing project, so to speak, is that from a larger culture, you get larger invention and larger creativity. Um, and that's been actually one of the rules in human history. Um, several thousand years ago, the population of the world was, let's say, about a million, say 10,000 years ago, when civilization kicked off. Well, now it's over 7 billion. That is, it's gone up by factors of more than 1,000. And therefore, we get enormously larger creativity. So our underlying theory is that bigger is better in terms of civilizations. Um, there are obvious counterexamples. Uh, Athenian Greece created a great deal of the beginning of modern high culture, and it was very small. It only had about 30,000 people in it, plus some slaves. Uh, it was not a megapolis like Buenos Aires, for example, uh, which has a population far larger than the world had 5,000 years ago. Uh, so. That's the central idea behind all these is to walk through the consequences of having a very large structure with a lot of diverse species in it, aliens, and many different cultures and a very long history because the bowl of heaven has been around tens of millions of years. Bigness gives you not just scale, it gives you lifetime. And the bowl is so big that nobody can really do major damage to it. And so you can just let time be on your side. If you're big enough, nobody can conquer the bowl. <laughs> they don't have time. It's way, it takes way beyond a lifetime to get anything done on any kind of scale on the bowl. So in size is security. That's true, by the way, of the larger cultures of the world. There's a reason that big places like China and Russia and India and North America uh, persist because they're too big to fail in a certain sense. Um, are we back to the slides? No, it's still on that slide. No. Well, okay. 
Well, look. I apologize. Uh, our host lost internet, so I am working on getting them up. I will have them in two minutes. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, yes, uh, one of the, uh, a little quote at the bottom of the uh, colophon page on the novel itself says, no electrons were harmed in the writing of this novel, which of course is a joke because you see that about animals in movies all the time. But of course, you can't really harm an electron except by introducing it to a positron, in which case they all annihilate into gamma rays. But uh, we thought it was an insider's joke. Um, uh, Larry, why don't you talk about how we all came to do this? It's taken us a decade. Larry? The electrons have been disturbed. This is yes. in the process. They they do. You know, inevitably we get questions about how do you guys work together? Why don't you talk about that, Larry? Okay. Uh, it's, it's about the same way you work. You, you, you talked about science fiction in the eighth grade. You weren't making up your own stories. You were finding each other's stories. Sometimes you made them up. Uh, we talk like fans until the story emerges. And we keep talking throughout it so that we don't tear off in different directions. Uh, it's, a, it's a recreation um, as, as well as it is a, a uh, calling. Uh, we, uh, I've done this with, with about a, a half dozen collaborators over my life. And, it, and every one of them is different. Uh, with with Greg, it's the uh, it, it was the, it was the talking thing. Although uh, although I used the same techniques with uh, with with uh, Jerry Fornell, with Greg with uh, Stephen Barnes, it was a it was a student teacher relationship for uh, for at least the uh, first couple of decades uh, with. Uh, David Gerald, it was just fun. We were just trying to top each other. You always try to try to top top each other when you're collaborating. Uh, right. show, show the other author some, uh, something he hadn't thought of. That's right. It, that's the joy of collaboration, and it occurs. One should note only in the genre of science fiction. No other literature has a whole lot of co-authored books. Or in the case of Larry, he has three authored books, he and Jerry Purnell and Steve Barnes. Uh, and I think this mirrors the scientific culture because after all, I'm a professional scientist, a professor of physics at UC Irvine. But the point is the majority of all the papers in the sciences have multiple authors. Science is a communal effort. There are the occasional isolated geniuses like Newton, Einstein, and so forth, who seldom really collaborate with anyone. But for the most part, science fiction, which descends from the culture of science and technology, echoes the culture it came from. Collaboration is common because it's fun to kick ideas around and you can get a better view of of the world and of a narrative if you hear from other voices. Uh, and I think that's one of the great strengths of science fiction because we just keep having new ideas uh, and working out the implications. Um, that's not true of the detective novel, the romance, or anything really. Um, and this novel emerges from that kind of thing. Larry and I kicking it back and forth, thinking of things, well, what about this? What about that? After all, if the, for example, if the bowl is really that old, how come it doesn't have kinds of life that we never even thought of? So we introduced a life that at first glance looks like a rock, which is actually not crazy because if you look at the computer you're working on, you know what makes it work? Layers of silicon with circuits embedded in them. All this is made possible by a smart rock that's electronically engineered. Uh, 
And so we also have a thing called the ice mines, which are extremely low temperature life forms, and they live on the outside of the bowl, although you don't discover that until the second novel, which is titled uh, uh, Ship Star. That is, the star is a ship. Okay, hey, we're back. We've got the slides. So go down about 10 slides or so. <laughs> until we get to the art. I wanted to point out that in this uh, novel, Larry and I employed two different artists, Don Davis to do the astronomicals and Brenda Guerre to do sketches uh, of the life forms that we saw or the, the, you know, the characters saw on the third novel, which is glorious. Keep going about five more slides. There we go. Through that, more, 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 more. Right, here we get, ah, here's our old friend, the bowl, uh, with a nice big jet that goes, flows through the knot hole. Next slide. See, that's a somewhat closer vision as you're starting the approach, and then you notice that there are defenses along the rim, and you don't want to go there. Next. So instead, uh, you notice the, the engineering is this. This is also done. See the signature by Don Davis? It, that's how the physics works. You're on a curved surface with, with always a gravitational centrifugal effect thrusting you away from the axis. Next. So here's what the ocean looks like. Next. Uh, here's going through flying against the jet to get into the bowl. I must admit, when we designed this at first, we hadn't even thought of going through the knot hole, uh, which is magnetically controlled, by the way. That's a theme all the way through the book, is the advanced technologies are controlled by magnetic fields and grapplers because it's more secure and easier to, to manipulate and change because it's not a solid object. Next. Oh, yeah, this is the bold scene uh, for its beauty when you're standing on a mountain and looking all the way across something on the scale of the solar system. You can see the knot hole up there with the jet going through it at the top. Next. It's also a seat, please. You're within the bowl so that the uh, gamma ray lasers can't shoot, have, would have to shoot down on in right. territory to get you. Right. You may need to be someday if you were talking about. Right, the, the bowl folk, as they're called, are not stupid, they don't allow these big weapons to be able to point at parts of the bowl, <laughs> an obvious problem. And there's a zigzag tree on the right and a human walking away from it on the left. Uh, and you still get this great vista. Next, and over on the right is the thing that under amplification looks like a fish, but it's actually a balloon. But it's a creature, a balloon creature in comparatively lower gravity whose crew is a gang of symbiotes who manage this thing, which is about, by the way, a mile long. And it has everything in it, uh, living quarters, weaponry. It, it's an all-purpose animal that flies through the air, more or less keeping the peace like the Texas Ranger. Uh, and it's a living creature. It has a big eye and on all these observation domes in it and so forth. This is, I think, Larry, wasn't this your invention? Uh, maybe. It's hard to tell. Conversations happen and uh, creatures emerge. I did design the uh, first intelligent uh, aliens we ran across. Oh. Inglorious, that is. Right. The, the book is full of all these aliens and inventions and strange things. Next. Um, and then, now we finally got to the novel, which concludes this trilogy. The first was Bowl of Heaven, the second was Ship Star. Now the third is Glorious, because Glorious is the actual target of the human expedition. Turns out the reason it met, or coming alongside the bowl, was that the bowl was headed that way too. And it has a prior history with this system, which the humans didn't quite realize is actually a double planet. And it has this enormous structure between the worlds, uh, coupling the two worlds together because both worlds are what we call tide locked. The inspiration was there for this was 
the NASA mission that flew by the system of the planet Pluto, I still think it's a planet, and its big moon, uh, Charon, both of them see the same face of the other planet all the time, the way we see only one half of the moon. Now, we're not tied coupled to the moon, so we spin around in the frame of the moon, but the moon is always facing us. Well, that's true of both of these worlds. And therefore, what's natural? You build a bridge between them and a habitat. It's a huge habitat. It's thousands of kilometers across and about a quarter of a million kilometers long. So this is another kind of giant construct. And that's why the bowl of heaven is interested in it. So of course the humans, pesky humans, they come in and they land on it and they explore it. And that's the bulk of the novel. Try to figure out what this all means. What, what, because you see, these are giant structures built by much more advanced societies that have been around millions of years. And so what are they like? What are, what are their concerns? What are they worried about in a sense? And how do, how do they choose to live? That's really the theme of the whole book. So you get to see a whole lot of strange approaches to how to live in the long-term future. And as Larry always pointed out to me, this is a way of thinking about how societies evolve on a scale of planetary scales, or time scales, that is millions of years. Because our civilization is only 10,000 years old. The whole species is only 200,000 years old. What do you do if you have millions of years? That's the true large human prospect. Next. Well, you, and the concluding, this is the last slide bit, this is one of the things you see in the air. And for most of the novel, you can't figure out what it is, nor, nor look in the characters. It's something in the air, and it's a manifestation of a kind of consciousness and being that we don't have at all. This is, in a sense, the way the being keeps track of what's going on, and it's widespread, and it's always there in the background. Because big objects require smart management. And this is part of the smart management. It's got to be dispersed and it's got to be powerful too. So this is an enigma that runs all, almost all the way through the novel. And, uh, and it's quite pretty too. Brenda Guerre did the illustrations for this. She has something like 15 line drawings in the entire book. Um, so it was just a lot of fun, fun to do this. I think that's the last slide, isn't it? I don't remember adding anything. Oh, here it is. No, you can read this. I won't read it to you. Basically, all large societies are conservative because you have to be careful if you live in a constructed place. If you live in a big city, so you have to be careful too. You can't be like you're just living out on the farm. Uh, and that's kind of a lesson about large scale. Um, civilizations. What we've learned is that cities imply imposed order. They have to have that. After all, the police forces are only two centuries old. Before that, there was no local contrivance except a, a sheriff or two, like the sheriff of Nottingham in um, ancient English history. Um, so I just wrote this note here about now the fact that, that it, all large systems are delicate and they have many failure points. And so you have to manage them carefully. And that means intelligent life has to be always aware, always running along. Um, and the bowl of heaven is an example of how you have to catch every mistake and therefore they're inevitably big smart objects. Civilization itself is a big, smart object. Um, we're not hunter-gatherers anymore, and we never will be now. Larry, you got anything to add? Uh, probably, but I never, I never think of the right question at the right time. Uh, well, why don't we go to questions then, Emily? Yeah, let me read you some of the questions we have here. Um, and Larry, if you can get just a bit closer to your computer, I think we might be able to hear you just a bit better. Um, I need to get closer to the computer? 
I think it would just help us hear you a bit better if you could just move in a little closer. I can shout. <laughs> that, yeah. Um, you'll notice that my collaborator does a lot more of the talking than I do. This has always been the case. Uh, with, with Jerry, he had to, he taught himself to, to uh, get me talking on a panel. I'm, I'm a guy who reacts, but uh, I usually get my say during the collaboration. Right. Well, of course, I'm a professor and therefore a hired talker. Yeah. <laughs> I talk to my After all. And David does a lot of lecture and has to do a lot of collaborating. David Jarrow uh, is a script writer. Uh, in, in, in the television industry, you, get, you constantly get uh, involuntary collaborators, collaborators you don't choose. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the reasons I gave up on working in Hollywood. Is um, I don't like uh, working with um, involuntary collaborators, shall we say, <laughs> particularly directors. Um, anyway, you, you, Emily, you had some questions. We do. All right. So the first question is: Wouldn't the mass of the bowl be far greater than that of the star? Wouldn't the bull's gravity exceed that of the star as well and tend to draw the star to the bull? No, it's not. It comprises the uh, mass of uh, a lot. I mean, uh, essentially the, something like the mass of Jupiter, but that's a tiny fraction of the mass of the star. The star is a really, a star is a really big dumb object because it only works because fusion works. <laughs> you, uh, and it, you make the, the bull as thin as you like in order to use, to use just the mass you are able to find. Yeah, it's massive. It's quite massive. Uh, it's maybe a, maybe the size of a hot Jupiter or several Jupiters. Uh, right. The world was only a few miles thick, and so is the bowl. That's right. Yeah. So it's it looks big, but it's not deep. It's you know you think of the skyscraper is mostly air. It's just a frame with air inside it. The, uh, the, ring, the ring world was the, was the mask of the world. So is the bowl. It's, it's not a world. It's just a mask. Uh, mountains, uh, mountains are dimples from the other side. O oceans are bulges from the other side, from the back side. Right. Most well, all large human structures are hollow. Mountains are not. So, Emily, next. All right. Our next question uh, is asking you if you can explain your collaborative writing process. And I think it's another question that kind of follows up on that, so I'll ask them together. And the other question is, does one person write and the other edit? No. Uh, no. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. um, collaboration involves uh, a lot of talk, a lot of shared meals, fair amount of alcohol, and uh, uh, brainstorming, as it's called in the industry, um, which is a great way to create anything, in my opinion. By the way, my scientific career has been mostly spent in collaborations with people, particularly when you're doing an experiment, because it's very hard to do an experiment with one person. Not, not in high energy density plasma physics, which I worked in. Um, so collaboration is a joy, really. And it's not the image of the isolated introverted uh, writer who who's lives inside his head. That's, that's true of some people, Isaac Asimov, for example, Dean Koontz. Um, but the virtue of, of science fiction is that collaboration is an asset. dance in which I'm doing the editing and the other writer is doing most of the writing. Uh, I've done that with, uh, with, with uh, Stephen Barnes and with Ed Lerner. Uh, often I'm able to add something. There, there, there are points where I just jump in, but, but the, the other writer is doing most of the uh, race traffic. Right. Um, 
it's it's really an asset collaborating because uh, you voice ideas on each other, but it's also a cautionary thing. I mean, occasionally we have to apply the brakes saying, hey, it doesn't make any sense. It's not going to lead to a good place. And, and we go back and rewrite and refigure because plotting is a giant machine. After all, stories are themes brought out by the machine of a plot. And uh, the machine needs some tuning and some oiling now and then. Uh, next. All right, uh, the next question is about the bowl. How is the bowl created? Where does the material come from? How long does the construction take? And there's another related question asking about uh, the kind of resources both to construct and then to live in the bowl. That was fun. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we decided that a, bra a branch of dinosaurs had built the bowl. Uh, we eventually decided that they had cooperation from the ice mines, uh, helium-2 helium uh, based creatures in the uh, cometary halo. But the uh, that the sun was a, was a double star. There, there was a red dwarf uh, attached at one point. The uh, dinosaurs got to that, and they cleaned out that, that branch of the solar system uh, using using the material to build the bowl. Right. It was made from the, a lot of a solar system, which turns out to be ours for reasons you'll discover. Um, and built by a, a, a line of intelligent dinosaurs who were so smart that they left on the bowl, leaving behind their dumb cousins who eventually got hit by an asteroid because they didn't even have a space program, as Larry always says. <laughs> well, right. If you want to stick around in, in the galaxy, you better have a space program because it's a dangerous neighborhood. And if you want to leave the neighborhood, you need a space program. Right. You need to take a taxi out of the dangerous neighborhood. <laughs> there are all kinds of these analogies available in the series. Yeah. Uh, next chat question. All right. The next question is, do you start with a science concept that you want to explore, or do you start with a human story and build up the science as the story develops? Speaking, speaking for myself, I do my research for fun, and I, and I hope the research will develop into <coughs> and it often does. Right. I, I usually start with a scientific idea because, after all, I'm a scientist. I've had many, many plots and for novels and stories suggested by things I noticed in physics and biology, and then build a story about it. Like, here's the central idea, and now how do people react? Who are these people? Why are they involved? If you keep asking these questions, the plot builds itself. Uh, a plot is an answer to a question, after all. Also a lecture. <laughs> right. In our hands, a lecture. They're bigly and glorious, the last novel. There are a lot of explanations and visions of strange things which the humans don't necessarily understand very well, but at least you get a glimpse of what they are. The idea being that uh, this is the introduction to a whole new kind of species no human ever encountered or even thought of. And so where does that lead? It's like being... Uh, uh, the first to European to uh, go into, say, uh, the, the lands of Araby and during the Crusades. It was a completely different kind of way of thinking and of living and of being. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that built the world civilization we have now is cultures in collision, so to speak. This is just cultures colliding on a scale of stars. Yeah. All right, the next question is, any movement on the adaption of Ringworld? Uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for people to react, for, for MGM to react. And, and, uh, and they don't seem to be reacting fast. Uh, beyond that, I'm told they, they have, a, uh, they have a, a producer or a writer or something. Yeah, they have a script. 
I should I should say that uh, a man named Robert Mandel and his uh, partner owned the uh, Ring World and known space rights, and uh, and they've been doing the dealing. They owned it for forty years. Yeah, uh, Hollywood is a swamp. Few escape. <laughs> All right, the next question, uh, sort of related, is Is there any chance of experiencing an interactive environment, such as a video game, based on such an awesome artifact like the Starship or the Ring World? I've, I've done some talking with, uh, with people who, who make games, not recently though, and nothing, let's see, a few things did come of it. Uh, there, there is a Ring World game, a two party. And, uh, sorry, there's a Ring World game from Caelosium that is a board game with a lot of hooks. But there is also a video Ring World game that did not succeed very well in popularity. Uh, I've uh, done some work in comic books too. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. Industry. I like visuals for that matter. I always have. Uh, Greg, was, would, Greg did well getting Don Davis involved in the visuals for the uh, whole of Heaven series. Right. Don Davis and, and Brenda both showed us that uh, what you can finally see with your eyes informs what you think. I mean, because human beings are highly visual people. So that's why we brought in Don, particularly from, for all three books, because he would notice things about the way we described it and, and the implications of it that we hadn't thought of. Uh, that's why collaboration is a good idea in science fiction. I also write, like writing with uh, Michael Boylan, who, uh, who really does his research and then goes into metaphors. Yeah. Right. All right, the next question is, to what earlier science fiction authors do you most strongly gravitate? Ooh. Well, Larry? Uh, sure. Uh, there, there are books you, you must have read. Uh, Mission of Gravity is canonical. Uh, let's see. Uh, short stories by Arthur C. Clarke, and also uh, 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 I'm bad with names, guys. They're escaping. Well, Paul Anderson, for example. I mean, the whole thing we've done is this is an exaggerated form of world building because these are worlds that are built literally by the aliens. But what Paul Anderson and Hal Clement did was look at exotic planetary environments and what species evolved there. And they were really good at that. That was the 1950s. Uh, we have taken it a step further because we literally have the aliens build the world. It's not just a planet. Uh, and uh, all that tradition, that, that it still follows through. The, the world building is done all the time in science fiction now. It was a new idea in the 1950s. Uh, where you, the prior fiction was about going to Mars or other places and battles in space and so forth. But world building is a new kind of thing in literature. It's rethinking all the premises of how life conveys itself and lives in an environment and is shaped by it. And that comes out of both modern physics, but also modern biology. Um, remember, um, some argue that Frankenstein is the first science fiction novel but Mary Shelley didn't know anything about evolution, even. She was thinking about artificial people. Uh, well, once you have evolution in the equation, things change. Okay. Uh, I, I tend to remind people, or try to, that Donnie's Divine Comedy was the first science fiction trilogy. Uh, his science has become fantasy 
afterward. But in the meantime, he mm -hmm. had a structure bigger than the bowl of heaven. Right. And a recent novel, for example, in a planet uh, in which plants dominate the ecosphere and are the most intelligent structures uh, by Sue Bork. Uh, that's a really original idea because um, I'd never seen anybody in science fiction think about a, a world so different that the plants are smart and the animals stupid. That's an interesting idea. And it's a different kind of planet. Yeah. In fact, Sue Burke has a sequel novel out you know, along the same lines, but I haven't seen it yet. Next. All right. The next question is, what kinds of calculations did you run for the series? As in, what questions were you trying to answer? What types of mathematics were involved? Mostly linear differential equations, <laughs> which is my forte. I let most of the math work to uh, to Greg because he's the plasma physicist. Yes, and plasma physics. He had the uh, his work was the uh, the uh, communications device that used for, uh, many black holes. Yes, in in fact, I and my buddy, uh, old time, was a Texas science fiction fan from my early days, Al Jackson, published a paper about the gravitational wave generator that. The Glorians have invented totally new idea in science fiction, also in science. So we actually published it as a scientific paper, and uh, it's been well looked at. People never thought about how how would you actually make a signal by manipulating tiny little black holes so you could communicate with gravitational waves. Um, that actually is a good example of a science fiction novel that generated a scientific paper. I've uh... I've done that. Um, yes, you yeah. have. Robert Forward was working on uh, on uh, many black holes and their their progress through through a through a solid object. He couldn't think, he, he knew they would inter interact, but he couldn't figure out how. So I, I published the whole man. Uh, right. It, it's title effects. That are happening and uh, running through through a wall of concrete leaves a channel of uh, very fine dust. That's a molecule. The molecular bonding bonding gets torn apart. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes science fiction generates scientific interest because a lot of the readers are scientists or engineers. We're close to it. Next. The next question is, are there lesser known science fiction authors who you would recommend? Uh, well, There's plenty of them. Be if, I could, if I had a grasp of names, get, get Neil Stevenson. He, he's a wonderful writer. Neil Stevenson. Uh, mostly yeah. by the time a new writer has got my, has got my attention and got his name stuck in my head. Uh, he's a middle-aged writer. Right. But, and, and there are people that are also middle-aged, but very interesting, like Alan Steele's novels, uh, Jim Cambius, Paul McCauley in, in England, um, uh, Steve Baxter, who's written a long series of interesting novels like that. Linda Nagata, uh, who lives in Hawaii and has written a lot of interesting science fiction about the future of information and also biology. Um, and uh, of course, there are the perennials now, not now with us, uh, uh, such as uh, Ursula Le Guin, of course, famous in Powell's, who really did a great deal for science fiction. Well, she's not new, of course, but she was new once. I can remember when she was <laughs> new and uh, I was running a, a Science Fiction Writers of America meeting in 1969 and she showed up because she'd been nominated but she'd never met anyone in the field everybody was young once some are young forever <laughs> next 
The next question is, did you calculate whether burning the star for propulsion significantly reduces its lifespan, or is the impact inconsequential? As mass is reduced, does the star cool significantly? Yes, it does over time, but uh, you know, there are always more stars. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, but it reduces the star lifetime by something on a scale of 100 million years. But stars of that mass last about 8 billion years, so it's not really a worry. Um, and as I say, you can always find another star if you need to. <laughs> not that I know how to do it. <clears throat> and, and the bowl of heaven is traveling around the galaxy, so it could find another star that suited itself. I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. <laughs> Next. All right, the next question is, in your opinion, what are the top two sci-fi collaborations? Oh, wow. I love those collaborations by Frederick Pohl and... Uh, uh, Cyril Cornblow. Pohl and Cornblow, for example. Pohl and Cornblow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was in, in the 50s. Jack yeah. and everybody else. Well, gosh, I never think about other collaborators. Um, there must be an obvious case that I we haven't thought of right now. Um, of course, Phil Moore and her husband, Ed Hamilton, wrote a bunch of really good stuff back in the 1940s. That was a husband and wife team. Um, you don't see that very often, ever, in any literature. Anyway. Uh, but uh, actually, I think the, the best collaborators were Niven and Purnell. <laughs> I mean, they're the only collaborative team, well, okay, except for <laughs> Larry and myself, who made the bestseller list, as far as I can remember. Yeah. Repeatedly. Yes. We, Jerry Purnell and I, had the most money paid as an advance, as an advance for books. We held that record twice. Briefly, you, you right. couldn't really pay uh, Robert Heinlein or Arthur Clarke in peanuts when you were paying us in uh, in much bigger bundles of peanuts. Yes, yes. I mean, you guys really, really knocked the ball out of the park repeatedly, particularly with football, which I still think would be a great television series. I do too. Uh, in fact, everything I've written would make a great movie. <laughs> right. It's really true. Really true. Um, Lucifer's Hammer, yeah. Big Rock Hits Earth, started the Big Rock Hits Earth series, which I also I also contributed to with a novel with Bill Rossler called Icarus Descending. Um, Shiva Descending. Oh, sorry, Shiva Descending, right, not Icarus. Um, wrong wrong uh, theology. Uh, but, uh, but then they followed it up with... Um, even bigger successes. This never happens in the rest of the literature. <laughs> Next. All right, the last question I've got for you here. So if anyone has a last minute question, please ask it. Uh, the last one I've got here is if you're both staying safe and healthy in this current virus crisis. Yes. Yes, yeah. be careful. I have to be. My, my wife is... Uh, is handicapped uh, with, with uh, very, very much a possible target of the virus. Right. Same for me. In fact, we're, we're headed up to the High Sierra uh, in Mammoth uh, within a couple of weeks for the rest of the summer, where there's essentially nobody at 8,000 feet. Um, the, the, the lesson is this isn't going away anytime soon. We will be having this conversation next year. Yeah. All right, I've got one last question for you that came in and that's what's next? Are you collaborating on another novel at the moment? No. Larry, you're working with Steve Barnes, aren't you? Yeah, I'm working with Steve Barnes on a possible uh, Kill the Arm story. Kill, kill the Arm uh, of, the, of the amalgamated regional militia. 
the uh, the uh, uh, police force, the United Nations police force of uh, the twenty one, the twenty two hundreds. Right, Gilly Arm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I am. Back when I was younger. I am just finishing a novel called Shadows of Eternity about a woman who's a librarian in the SETI library two centuries from now in which SETI messages are very much more complex than what we now envision. And it leads to all kinds of interesting subplots and complications and aliens, by the way. Uh, I am just finishing that novel this week. I'll turn it into Simon Schuster and I hope it'll come out next week, though with the state of New York publishing, you never know. Um, and after that, I'm going to do a collaboration with my friend Michael Rose in an espionage novel set in the 1980s based on my uh, long experience with uh, the espionage community and the Central Intelligence Agency. It, it's mostly about the Soviet Union and uh, how to deal with it. Um, and let's see, after that I plan a novel that's set around where I grew up in Mobile Bay, Alabama. But it's also a science fiction novel after aliens arrived from Alpha Centauri. But unlike uh, any other smart creature we've involved, been involved with, uh, except dolphins, the aliens are amphibians, which leads to some interesting collisions between biologies. So plans afoot. Anything more? All right. Well, I think that was the last question, but I just want to thank you both so much for coming. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining tonight's event. It was such a pleasure to host you and, and welcome all of you here. Uh, please consider purchasing a copy of Glorious uh, by visiting us at powells.com. Um, my dog wants to say hello, too. I'm sorry if you heard that. <laughs> um, while you're there, please <laughs> be sure to check out our lineup of other events. Um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. We have those book plates. You can get them. Yes, there are signed book plates. So if you order your copy now, come with a signed book plate. Thanks a lot, Emily. Thank you so much. Good night.